Well, hello everybody, how's it going? Welcome to D4. D4. D&D Deep Dive. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons and Dragons. We crunch numbers about them, we theorycraft about them, not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a specific character, but to explore one potential way to build and play a character in D&D in the hopes of creating something that is both really fun, but also really powerful to play. So if you enjoy creating characters for D&D, almost as much as you enjoy actually playing the game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on how to build a particular character you're thinking about building, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for being here. My name's Colby, and I will be your host. Really quick, if you would be interested in receiving a cheat sheet, a step-by-step -step guide to help you recreate this character, or any of the other character builds that I do on this channel for that matter, or if you're just interested in supporting the channel a little more than you already are, I would greatly appreciate it if you would consider joining as a channel member. There should be a little join button down there. Um, for $2 a month, you get access to the library of write-ups of these cheat sheets that I do for each of my builds so that you don't have to go back and re-watch the video and take notes if you wanted to recreate the character yourself. Huge thanks to my channel members. You guys are awesome. And to everybody else, you're also awesome. Just watching and liking and commenting and subscribing are also fantastic ways to support the channel, so thanks to you too. You know what's kind of crazy? I don't actually use wizards all that often for builds on this channel. I mean, of course, outside of my many Bladesinger builds, of which there are like 57 at the moment. I mean, sure, I've done an enchanter, I've dipped into war magic, scribes wizard, necromancy, abjuration, even an evoker or two, but again, aside from Bladesinger's I might have taken fewer wizard levels than any other character class in the game, I'd be willing to bet. If somebody wants to make that a research project, feel free. <laughs> and that seems a little crazy, right? For a channel that focuses on building characters that are both fun but powerful. Because, as everybody knows, wizards are the most powerful class in D&D 5e, right? I mean, maybe, probably, arguably. But if that is true, why is it true? If it's true, then it has to be because of their spell list, I think. Wizards, as everyone knows, get access to more spells in the game than any other class. And spells, as everyone knows, are probably the single most powerful thing that a character can get access to in D&D 5e, I would argue. Does, does everyone know that? I, I keep saying that. One thing is for sure. Everyone does know that Australia is entirely peopled with criminals. And criminals are used to having people not trust them as you are not trusted by me, so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of you. I think it's probably true, and, and at the very least is a very easy argument to both make and support. If wizards really are all that powerful, why don't I use them more often in builds? I think it's for two primary reasons. One, they're not all that easy to multi-class with, and I really love multi-classing my characters. As everyone knows, <laughs> okay, sorry, I'll stop. As characters who want to focus on intelligence more than anything, wizards can be pretty difficult to multi-class without going mad. Well, not crazy, but multiple ability score dependent. You've basically got artificers for nice intelligence-based synergy, and that's about it, arguably maybe with the exception of a couple of subclasses. Not to say that getting like a 14 dexterity for either some rogue or fighter levels is all that hard, but if you're going rogue or fighter, you're delaying your spells and your spell slots, and since wizards are primarily amazing because of their spells, it's really difficult to justify delaying that spell progression for any reason whatsoever. And Again, I think reason number two why I don't tend to use them so much is if the thing that makes them so dang powerful is the really powerful spells that they get access to, usually, making a really strong wizard just kinda means take the best spells. A ton of the subclasses, conjuration, illusion, transmutation, etc., don't really have an ability in their subclass features that, to me at least, scream out, this is a really cool and unique feature that you could totally build a character around that would be fun and powerful and unique. Generally speaking, and perhaps more than any other class, in my opinion, building a powerful wizard just means getting better and higher level wizard spells, and it's not that that can't be fun and powerful and even interesting, but 
it can feel a little difficult for me to find a way to make, say, a conjuration wizard all that interesting or different when compared to, say, a transmutation wizard. You know what I mean? Maybe I'm just really crappy at making wizards. And yes, of course, there are plenty of exceptions to these things, and I've tried to take advantage of them. But one of those exceptions that I haven't really tried to take much advantage of to date is the Chronergy Wizard. I did use Chronergy Magic one time in my first ever team-up build, uh, the two-character build, Brainy and the Beast, the Wizard and the Druid. They were focused on like big area of control damage and sustained damage over time to those enemies that you had controlled. I think that it would be an absolute blast to play that duo with a friend. And yeah, for the Wizard I took Chronergy Magic, though the Chronergist aspect of that build was a little bit irrelevant to the build for the most part, I think. So today, I really wanted to try to find a way to make the Kroner just shine. In particular, thanks to a very powerful and unique ability that they get that you don't really see a lot of in D&D 5e. It's something that could potentially allow us to do some really powerful, I think, burst damage especially, among other things, but that is what we're going to be building for today primarily is Nova damage or burst damage. Now, a word of caution. Unfortunately, this feature that I'm talking about that I'm eyeballing is one that chronergists don't get until pretty late in their character career. It's not until character level 10, which for a lot of us, depending on our table and the adventure that we're playing, will be at the end or very near the end of our character's career. So I guess I will say, be warned that the real power spike that this character will get when compared to other wizard builds and other Nova or burst damage builds will come on relatively late. But when it does come, it's pretty dang awesome. And, I mean, hey, good news. Before level 10, you're still a freaking wizard. So you're going to be among the more powerful characters in D&D 5e, regardless, without really trying that hard. Preamble done, I proudly present episode 120, The Time Wizard. And really quick, before we do jump into the build, I wanted to share a quick word about the sponsor for the video this week. It's the new 5e adventure campaign by Quest Nest called The Divine Forge. Now. The Divine Forge is actually more than just a standalone adventure. It's really more of a 5e supplemental book. It's over 300 pages long, and it's filled with lots of really unique and cool locations, magic items, spells, and of course, fantastic NPCs and monsters that you could take and plug into your own campaign if you really wanted, making it a really nice treasure of supplemental D&D goodness. But as for the adventure that the book also contains, the Divine Forge takes place in the province of Talos, with your heroes caught up in a war with the undead. From there, things unfold, and before long you will find yourself fighting against cultists, attempting to create a blood elemental, planning a prisoner escape from a stronghold held by dragons and a hobgoblin wizard, where they are testing aetherforged weapons on the innocent. You're going to be trying to stop a green dragon who's attempting to accelerate their aging in order to become more powerful, and ultimately attempting to destroy the Divine Forge itself, though you're going to have to get past more undead, driders, and even a drow warlock priestess along the way. Divine Forge is currently, as of the release of this video, in Kickstarter and have blown well past their funding goal, so yes, this project is greenlit, it is going to be published. Huge congrats to Quest Nest on that achievement. As of this video release, there are only a few days left in the Kickstarter. So if all of this sounds as fun to you as it does to me, you should absolutely go back this project. I'm going to put a link in the video description for how to get there. I'd appreciate it if you would use that so that they know I sent you. And yeah, help them reach that next stretch goal. As you probably know, there are always lots of fantastic goodies available for those who back the project in Kickstarter that you're not going to have access to if you wait until the Kickstarter is over. So don't delay. Go check them out. Back them now. I can't wait to see the finished product. I know it's going to be fantastic. So big thanks to Quest Nest and let's jump into the build. All right. At level one for our starting class. Yes, we are starting wizard. If you can believe it, we're going to be in this class for quite some time. So when we first meet our character, they are not only interested in the arcane, but in particular, they are interested in how magic can influence time. Can it be used to speed things up? To slow things down? Can it be used to see into the future? Maybe relive the past? Or even 
pull an event from an alternate timeline into our own? These are all questions that our hero spends their life in pursuit of. And in fact, I think for this particular wizard, they might be drawing their inspiration from an ancient story that they've heard about a powerful mage that was able to control time in these ways. And we are constantly seeking to learn more about this legend from history to discover not only if it were really true, but also see how we might be able to learn from this legendary hero to see if we too can manipulate time in the ways that this character from history was able to do. As for our race, I'm going to recommend that we go with Kobold here. I really love Kobold on this build, not only because they're cute, fierce little dragonlings, but above all for their draconic cry feature that they get, which tells us that proficiency bonus times per day, as a bonus action, we can let out a ferocious cry, or perhaps an adorable cute little cry. <laughs> when you do this, until the start of your next turn, you and your allies all have advantage on attack rolls against any enemy that was within 10 feet of you and could hear you when you cried out. Now, a lot of people have complained that getting this feature instead of pack tactics which is what kobolds used to have before Monsters of the Multiverse, was a big nerf to kobolds. But I'm not 100% sure, to be honest. Not only did this update let us lose the pretty terrible sunlight sensitivity that kobolds used to have, but we also picked up Kobold Legacy, which gives us proficiency or advantage on saves against fear or a free cantrip, any of which are nice. And you know, pack tactics wouldn't work every round, especially with sunlight sensitivity, but also since it required an ally to be next to someone that you were attacking, which you might get most of the time, but then Draconic Cry by comparison gives advantage to all of your allies against potentially multiple enemies. Only for one round, sure, but that can be kind of amazing if we build for it, and is something we'll definitely be taking advantage of on this build. As for our starting abilities, I assume that we're going with the point by method as always, and would recommend taking a 15 intelligence and getting a plus two there from our racial, a 15 constitution and a plus one there, and then a 14 charisma. We want charisma for some multi-classing that we're going to be doing later, but it's much later. And you might also notice that this leaves us with a really miserable dexterity score, among other things. And since we have no armor proficiencies, this is going to mean that we will have have a very poor armor class. Are we a glass cannon? Yeah, we're a bit of a glass cannon. And honestly, I'm okay with that. I love high risk, high reward. But of course, you could go with say a 13 constitution plus one, a 13 charisma, and get a 14 dexterity for a better armor class. You could of course even take say a one level armorer dip here right at the beginning. That would give us constitution saving throw proficiency and access to medium armor. And it wouldn't slow down our spell slot progression at all, which is nice, but I don't want to slow the wizard levels down at all if I can help it since I'm really wanting to be line to Kroner just 10 here. So yeah, I'm just going straight wizard, but feel free to build a little more defensively if you really want to. As for our starting equipment, there's really nothing special that we need here. So I'm just going to say, take the standard stuff. Nothing that will need to increase our burst damage other than our spell book and a component pouch or a spell focus, right? So yep, just standard wizard accoutrement. As a wizard one, then, we get first up, arcane recovery. This tells us that once per day, after a short rest, we can recover expended spell slots equal to half our wizard level rounded up. None of which can be sixth level or higher. This is a really nice way to just get an extra spell or two later per long rest, and more spells are always good. As for the spells that we should take here at level one, I mean, of course you should take the usuals like shield, absorb elements, silvery barbs, <laughs> mage armor, sleep at these early levels at least is a fantastic control spell, but I'm just gonna focus here on three. While Toll the Dead is generally our highest damage cantrip doing a 1d12 failing a wisdom save so long as the enemy isn't at full health, we will have reason to want to actually be making attack rolls with our spells instead of casting spells against enemy saves thanks to the advantage that we get from Draconic Cry. Yes, but 
also for other reasons. So I'd be sure to grab Firebolt here as it does 1d10 of damage if we hit the enemy with a spell attack. Chromatic Orb is probably our best single target burst damage spell at this level. Again, since we're kobolds, you Draconic Cry, you get advantage. And the Chromatic Orb is a spell attack roll that we're making, right? It does 3d8 elemental damage of a damage type of your choice. And if we're using it with advantage, it will do more damage on average than Magic Missile all the way up to an enemy armor class of 18 or higher. And we're not going to see a lot of that at early levels, right? If we didn't have advantage, Magic Missile actually outshines it from an enemy AC of 12 or better. So maybe having both so you can use one or the other depending on the situation. But finally, I would just make sure to grab Find Familiar as it is infinitely useful thanks to the abilities that our familiar has both to scout ahead for us, but also of course for the familiar's ability to take the help action on their turn and grant a party member advantage on an attack. Meaning, sure, we could even get that advantage if we hadn't used Draconic Cry, so long as our familiar is alive. But we're also going to want to use that familiar later on during our Nova round. At level 2, wizards get their subclass, their arcane tradition, and yes, as I've said, we're going with Chronergy Magic. Here's what Wizards of the Coast, or maybe better yet, Matt Mercer, has written about Chronergists. Focusing on the manipulation of time, those who follow the Chronergy tradition learn to alter the pace of reality to their liking. Using the ramping of anticipatory dunamis energy, these mages can bend the flow of time as adroitly as a skilled musician plays an instrument, lending themselves and their allies an advantage in the blink of an eye. It's short, it's sweet, it's totally on point. So, as a chronergist, we get two really nice abilities here right off the bat. First off, chronal shift. This tells us that twice per day, it's too bad it's not proficiency bonus times per day, but oh well, after a creature we can see within 30 feet of us makes an attack, a saving throw, or an ability check, we can use our reaction to force them to re-roll, and we can wait until after we see if the roll succeeds or fails. Now, this works a lot like Silvery Barbs, though it can be used either defensively against an enemy or offensively, and it's really, really strong. For sure, I would save this for those times when we really need someone to fail or succeed on a saving throw, I think, for the most part, though of course it could be really handy to pull out if like an enemy gets a critical hit or drops an ally to zero hit points, etc. Just remember that we've got two uses of this a day, plus this Overy Barb spell too if we took it. A lot of nice ways to force rerolls here. And then we also get the Temporal Awareness feature, which lets us add our Intelligence modifier to our initiative rolls, which is especially great for us since we likely have a lousy Dexterity modifier. At level 3, we get second level spells, and the possibilities, as always with Wizards, are almost endless, from Levitate and Invisibility for utility purposes, to Web and Hold Person for really nice control, and everything in between. The one that I will concentrate on here for burst damage is Scorching Ray. Scorching Ray is an okay spell. It's honestly not all that amazing. Now, it can become pretty amazing if you find some great ways to add lots of damage on a hit, like we did with our flamethrower build a while back. But unfortunately, we don't have any of those things currently, so we simply get to do 2d6 damage on three rays that we can hurl either at the same enemy or multiple enemies. The good news is that we can potentially have advantage on all of those rays thanks to Draconic Cry, making the 6d6 total damage that the spell would do here a lot better than it otherwise would be. At level 4, we get our first ability score increase or feat, and I'm going to say that we go with the Fey Touched feat, one of my favorite feats in the game, and I want it for three reasons. First off, it's a half feat, letting us bump our intelligence by one, so our intelligence is now at a nice even 18. Second, it lets us learn the Misty Step spell, which is amazing. Teleportation, always handy. But then, 
Third, yes, it lets us learn a first level spell from any spell list, so long as it's either an enchantment or a divination spell. And I want Hex. Hex is typically only available to Warlocks. It's an enchantment spell, and I want it for these early levels as it will really help our Scorching Ray Nova damage quite a bit. As a quick reminder, with Hex, you cast it as a bonus action. It requires concentration, but thereafter, every time you hit your Hexed enemy with an attack, you do an extra D6 of damage to them. Again, the potential nice thing about Scorching Ray is that it fires multiple rays, each of which are considered an attack. So we can potentially rack up a few extra D6 here if we use them all in the same hexed target, right? Once our initial target dies, we can transfer the hex to someone else with a bonus action and then firebolt them for a d10 plus a d6, making it a nice little cantrip. And we can even use our familiar to give ourselves advantage on that firebolt on subsequent non-Nova turns, right? So yeah, hex is going to let us do a little better burst damage during our Nova round. That said, you very well may want to use your concentration for something else like web at this level. And if you were to decide to go that route, I would not blame you in the slightest. I'm just trying to push as much burst damage onto this character as I possibly can since, especially at this very first damage report that we're going to get to soon, they're not going to look particularly great. At level 5, if you are going to stop playing this character by level 9 or sooner, there's a strong argument here to take a couple levels of fighter, maybe here or maybe after this level, to pick up action surge so that we could cast two slotted spells on our turn during a Nova round if we really wanted to, if your focus was primarily on burst damage, right? I'm kind of assuming that we want to be a blaster wizard, yes, but we're also really interested in just being a wizard wizard, and that we care as much or more about all of the other amazing things that we get to do as a wizard with our amazing and powerful spells, and we can live without the extra burst damage that picking up action surge would give us. Also, so again, of course, like I've said, I'm beelining for Chronergy 10 here. So yes, we would be a wizard 5, and that means third level spells. And yeah, so many amazing third level spells, especially for wizards. Counterspell, Fly, Hypnotic Pattern, Fear, Haste, and Tiny Hut. But... I'll just make special mention of two. First up, Fireball, or I suppose if you prefer, Lightning Bolt. Now, both spells do 8d6 damage, and if you're counting, that's actually significantly less damage than Scorching Ray would do if cast as a third level spell, if we had Hex on a target, right? Scorching Ray now would also do 8d6 for the spell itself, but then 4d6 more if we hit one single target with each of those rays and they were hexed. But, of course, the benefits to Fireball or Lightning Bolt are that they can damage multiple enemies, right? Either in a 20-foot radius sphere or a 100-foot line, respectively. Whereas Scorching Ray on a single target would do 12d6 damage in total, but again, only to one target. Also, with Fireball and Lightning Bolt, if the enemy fails their save, they're still going to take half damage, and that's a pretty big deal since you're always doing some damage with the spell no matter what, unless they're immune to the damage type, of course. I still do think that there will be times that Scorching Ray would be the better choice, particularly when going up against a single enemy, naturally, or if you just really needed to burst down one single enemy as quickly as possible for whatever reason, but just know your options. I also want to make mention of Slow here. It is such a fantastic spell, and frankly, as a chronergist, who is supposed to be this master of time, right, I think grabbing it, and probably haste too for that matter, are important if for no other reason, thematic reasons. But mechanically speaking as well, slow is just such a great spell. You can hit up to six, yes, six creatures with it that are within the 40-foot cube of its area, and then it just throws out a slew of nasty debuffs on those who fail their saving throw against it. Their move speed is halved, they have a minus two penalty to their armor class and their dexterity saving throws, they can't use reactions, and on their turn they can only either take an action or a bonus action, but not both, and regardless they can't make more than one attack per turn if they have multi-attack. Finally, there's even a good chance that you might force a spellcaster to take two turns to cast a spell that normally would only take one. And I really love that 
thanks to the minus two to armor class penalty, slow both increases our damage and provides a really nice debuff control. And in that way, it sort of lets us have our cake and eat it too here, instead of forcing us to choose between doing more damage or controlling and debuffing our enemies, right? Your entire party will almost assuredly benefit more from you concentrating on slow than they would you concentrating on hex at this point, but the burst damage numbers will look a little bit better with hex, except for at very high enemy armor classes. But at level six, as a chronergist, we get momentary stasis, and this tells us that intelligence modifier times per day, we can use our action to force a large or smaller creature to make a constitution saving throw, and if they fail, they're encased in a field of magical energy until either the end of our next turn, that's nice, or when they take damage. Now, when they're encased in this way, they're incapacitated, which means no actions, no reactions, and they have a speed of zero. That's some really nice single target control, potentially, that doesn't require concentration, but it is limited by the fact that it costs an action and it allows for an enemy constitution save, which is a bit of a bummer. Still, it'll be nice to pull out if you're looking to conserve spell slots or just really wanted to lock down a single enemy for an entire round. All right, so at level six, it is time for our first damage report. And here's what combat is going to look like for us right now. First off, I will assume that we're using Hex because I'm a slave to the spreadsheet, but if you have the spell slot for it, and especially if you're fighting multiple enemies, feel free to pull out a slow or even fear or hypnotic pattern instead. Anyway, assuming Hex, on round one, we would Hex our target with our bonus action and then throw out a Firebolt for a little damage, or alternatively, feel free to use Momentary Stasis on your target, right, on round one, preventing them from doing anything and sort of calling out your target, right? Leave that one alone, he's mine. But round two is our Nova round. The best we can do currently for single target damage is to get within 10 feet of as many enemies as possible, but at least our target. Draconic Cry, which don't forget, will benefit our allies as well. And then throw out a Scorching Ray on the target that we have hexed at the third level, doing 8d6 of damage on four rays plus 4d6 more for hex for a total of 12d6 to a single target, with each of those attacks being made with advantage. And thus, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 46 damage, and against an enemy with a 15 armor class, it would be 41 damage. And so, yeah, that's not amazing but it's not terrible. It puts us about mid-tier three when compared to other Nova or burst damage builds that I've done to date at this level. And you can check in the video description to see the spreadsheets and graphs that show you those comparisons. But of course you are bringing a lot of potential utility, support, and control to the game in addition to just Nova damage because, well, you're a wizard. I'm not worried about you. You'll be just fine. At level seven, we get fourth level spells and I'm kind of just going to say pick your favorites. I mean, all the usual suspects should be considered, of course, from Polymorph to Dimension Door and everything in between. Using Scorching Ray on a hexed target is still our best burst damage option. But don't forget also to check out the spells that are available only to Chronergists and Graviturgists sometimes, you know, to get these Dynamancy spells to show up in D&D Beyond reliably, I think the best way is just to go into spells and then choose Dunamancy for the spell tag and filter it that way. There are lots of good and fun and powerful options here, assuming that your DM allows them, I guess. And I mean, if you're playing a Chronomancer, I'm not sure why they wouldn't. I'm not planning on using any of them in combat during our Nova round, but they're definitely worth looking into. At level eight, we get another ability score increase or feat and I think it's kind of a no-brainer to just bump our intelligence here, taking it to 20 and capping it. If we're building for damage, increasing both our chance to hit and the chance of our saving throws being able to stick is really good. But at level 9, we get 5th level spells. So finally, we get to the first part of what really made me want to go chronomancy with this character. 5th level spells are among the best in the game for their level, I think. So many good ones. Synaptic Static I just love for both the damage and the debuff. Wall of Force is one of the best control spells out there. Hold Monster is amazing for automatic criticals on almost any enemy in the game. But the one I really want to focus on here is, you guessed it, Animate Objects. So 
Animate Objects is one of the best damaging spells in the game, potentially. I haven't used it in a build for quite some time, so let's refresh ourselves on the details. You cast it with an action, it requires your concentration, and then for the next minute you can animate up to 10 non-magical objects that you can direct with your bonus action. Now. Once given an order, the objects will continue to follow your command until their task is complete. And for most of us, that should mean that you can simply say something like, attack the creature I'm attacking, or something like that, and then you shouldn't need to use your bonus action every single round to direct them. But some DMs may disagree there and require you to use your bonus action every round. Talk it over with them beforehand, for sure. Now, we could animate larger objects to get fewer of them, and sometimes there will be situations where that will be the right call, but generally we're going to want to animate 10 tiny objects, and my favorites tend to be silver coins for the sake of overcoming attacks from non-silvered weapons. But yeah, tiny objects are the best generally here because while they only do a d4 plus 4 each, they have the best hit chance of all the potential sized creatures, a uh, plus 8, which is not bad at all. There is one important thing to discuss with the Animate Objects spell, however, and it's this. If an enemy has resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks, these animated objects are probably only doing half damage. Now, I have seen a lot of people make the argument that because these objects are animated by a spell, they should be considered as their attacks being magical. And of course, your DM may decide to rule that way, in which case, Congratulations. I'm not going to fight you about it. But the consensus seems to be that though they're animated by magic, the slam attack that they make isn't considered magical itself, and thus no overcoming resistance. And you know, I don't actually feel too bad about this if that's the case at your table, for a couple of reasons. One, the spell is really, really strong. Even doing half damage, it's still pretty decent damage, especially since it can be done round after round after round, likely without even requiring your bonus action to do so. But then too, there might not actually be as many enemies in D&D 5e that have resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks as you might think. I think most of us have this impression that like after level six or seven or eight, just about every enemy we fight is going to have resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks, right? But the truth is, of the 2,500 or so official non-homebrewed enemies in D&D 5e, only about 250 of them have this resistance. That's only about 10%. Now, sure, at higher levels, it becomes more common, but okay, we're level 9 now. Of the 640 or so enemies that are challenge rating 9 and above, only about 100 120 of them have this resistance. That's still less than 20%. So building a character like we are doing this week to really take as much advantage of animate objects as we possibly can might not be as bad an idea as some people might think. Now, sure, your DM may decide that they're going to bring in mostly monsters with this resistance if you insist on always using the spell, or homebrew their monsters to have it. They might also just start handing out fireballs to every other enemy so that they can wipe out your coins in one fell swoop. But, I mean, these tiny animated objects do have an 18 dexterity with 20 hit points, so they're likely going to make their saving throw against most area of effect spells, and depending on the spell, that probably means that it's going to take a couple of castings of a certain spell to wipe out all of your coins at least, right? In the end, I love the spell, it's powerful, and of course, one thing that makes it really shine on this build is our little kobold selves, since we would be giving advantage to all 10 of those animated objects during our Nova round, thanks to our Draconic Cry, and that really increases the potency of what we can do. Finally, keep in mind that the spell does scale really nicely as well, adding two more animated objects for every level we upcast it, which we will definitely plan on doing when we crunch numbers. And speaking of, at level 9 it is time for our next damage report. And since last we checked, things have changed quite a bit for us. At this point, on round 1 we'd want to cast animate objects with our action, use our bonus action to tell them what to do. 
Then, on round two, our Nova round again, we'd run up, Draconic Cry, use a Scorching Ray spell at the fourth level. The damage is worse without Hex, but since we have advantage on our attacks, it's still going to be the best single target burst damage option we have. You know, if we're pretty confident that the enemy's gonna fail their save against a Fireball, or even Blight, which is even better for single target, but it's a con save. You know, feel free to go another route, of course, especially if you can get multiple enemies in a fireball. But yeah, since we're focused on single target and we have advantage on the attacks and almost a 10% chance to crit with those scorching rays, we're going to be better off going that route for single target. But then our animated objects on their turn would potentially do 10d4 plus 40 damage, all attacking with advantage. Not bad at all. And of course, the best part of this is that our sustained DPR would be pretty dang nice on subsequent rounds as well. We could just throw out cantrips with our action round after round, or even non-concentration leveled spells when need be, letting our animated objects do most of the heavy lifting for us damage-wise. But during our Nova round against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 106 damage, and against an enemy with a 16 armor class, it would be 95. So we We've broken the century mark, and that is more than double since last time we checked. We're now kind of more like near the bottom of tier 2 compared to other Nova builds that I've done at this level to date. We're moving on up, and we're still bringing all the potential utility, control, and even support that a wizard can bring. Buenísimo. But if you thought that that was as good as it was going to get for animate objects, you were wrong because at level 10, this is where everything really and finally comes together for this build. Because you see, as a chronergist, at level 10, we get Arcane Abeyance. And it is quite simply one of, if not the best, level 10 wizard ability in all of 5e, in my opinion. Here's how it works. Once per short rest, when you cast a spell of fourth level or lower, you can freeze the spell in time and condense it down to a little gray bead for one hour. You can give this bead to another creature and that creature can use their action to release the spell. The spell would use our attack bonus and spell save DC, but the spell treats the creature who released it as its caster for all other purposes, meaning, yes, if it's a concentration spell, that other creature can concentrate on the spell for you. And thus, we can essentially have two concentration spells going at the same time, and that is amazing. So yeah, this functions very similarly to the Artificer's spell storing item, except that we get it at a level earlier, level 10 as opposed to level 11 for them, and it can hold up to a fourth level spell as opposed to only a second level spell for Artificers. And we're wizards, we've got way better spells. Now, granted, the spell storing item gets a lot more charges than we do, but Hey, that's worth it. So, okay, who are we giving this little bead to? Why, our familiar, of course. There's nothing in the rules that would prohibit our familiar from casting or concentrating on a spell here. We're told that a familiar can't attack, but it can take other actions as normal. So, as long as the spell we're putting into our bead isn't an attack spell, we should be good. All right, in that case, the next question is, what spell should we be using here? Now, Obviously, you should really be using an awesome control spell like Fear or Hypnotic Pattern and not just selfishly trying to pad your own damage numbers, you glory hog. But of course, that's not what I'm going to do. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Hold on. I'm going to argue that, at this level at least, we can do both. Enter the slow spell. Yes, so if you recall, slow will not only seriously hamper what an enemy can do on their turn, but it will also lower their armor class by two, and for us and our allies and our little flying coins, that's going to continue to do really great things for our damage. Hooray! At level 11, I was tempted to start multiclassing here, but I really wanted to get to 6th level spells because while of course you should probably take mass suggestion or maybe contingency like a real wizard would, we are going to take Disintegrate. I mean, Disintegrate is the highest single target burst damage spell available to us at the moment, and really throughout any wizard's career until they get Meteor Swarm, doing a whopping 10d6 plus 40 damage if it works. But there is a big caveat to Disintegrate. 
it's not an attack spell, meaning we get no benefit from our draconic cry here. Though, of course, our animated objects still do, as well as our other attacking allies. Instead, with Disintegrate, the enemy makes a dexterity saving throw against it, and if they succeed, they take zero damage. Now, Fortunately for us, the slow spell that our familiar is concentrating on lowers not only the enemy armor class, but also their dexterity saving throws by two. What's more, our spell save DC at this level is a very respectable 17. And I mean, dexterity isn't typically a particularly great saving throw for most enemies in D&D 5e. We're level 11 right now. The average plus to dex save for a challenge rating 11 monster in the monster manual, at least, least is only a plus three. Subtract two from that if they're slowed, and they have a very slim chance of making their save against Disintegrate. Of course, you'll definitely run into monsters with a better plus to their deck save from time to time, and you'll definitely get monsters who get a lucky roll from time to time. And in those cases, blowing our sixth level spell slot on Disintegrate is going to feel really, really bad. Fortunately, we have Silvery Barbs and Chronal Shift. So we can make them re-roll that successful save and probably fail. Woohoo! For all of these reasons, I think Disintegrate is definitely worth considering and using here. If for no other reason, then it just feels really cool. Honestly, I mean, if you reduce an enemy to zero hit points with Disintegrate, they just poof into fine gray dust, which is kind of awesome. It's also really handy to take out things like enemy force fields and stone walls. And it scales by 3d6 for every level you upcast it, so it outpaces pretty much any other single target damage spell, so some really fantastic scaling there. Yes, I want Disintegrate. But at level 12, I think it's finally, finally time to take some levels in another class. This is absolutely not something that you should feel you have to do. In fact, a lot of people are gonna argue that you're crazy for thinking about it. It means we'd be giving up seventh, eighth, and ninth level wizard spells. Not to mention the really fantastic Chronergist feature, Convergent Future. But in the end, I have my sights set on a particular spell and I really need to take levels in another class to get that spell before we end this build at level 17. And the spell is going to do really great things for both our burst damage and also our sustain damage, as well as for the damage of our allies. So yes, at this point in our character's career, I think they become focused like a laser on that legend that I mentioned earlier about the one who was able to control time in a way greater even than we've been able to achieve thus far. We are searching out all that we can learn about this ancient champion to see if we can't finally unlock the secret of their power. But whatever your reasons, we are taking bard levels now. And so, as a bard one, we get bardic inspiration. First off, telling us that charisma modifier times per day, and that's kind of a bummer because it means only two for us, we can, with our bonus action, give a d6 to, which is our bardic inspiration die, to an ally within 60 feet of us who can hear us. That ally can then use that inspiration die in the next 10 minutes on an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. Super useful, really handy, and a nice use for our bonus action that we can take advantage of when we're not draconic crying or maybe casting a bonus action spell. Our allies will appreciate it, no doubt. As for what spells we should take here, keep in mind that bards use charisma as their spell casting stat, so I would try to take spells here that are more focused on support and that just work without allowing for like an enemy saving throw. So yeah, grab cure wounds and especially healing word so that your team has a nice little backup healer who can bring allies back from unconscious with a bonus action and from rage. We are building our support. At level 13, we would be a bard two, and that means we get jack of all trades. This is such a great feature. It really helps us improve our already strong utility. With Jack of All Trades, if you make an ability check that doesn't already include your proficiency bonus, you can add half of your proficiency bonus rounded down. Yes, this can apply to our initiative rolls, which are ability checks. And so now we get to add our intelligence modifier and half our proficiency bonus, which is kind of awesome. We have a plus seven to our initiative rolls now with a crappy dexterity score. We also get Song of Rest, which tells us that when anyone in our party is spending hit dice to recover hit points during a short rest, we can play a lovely tune or tell a soothing tale, and then they get to add an extra d6 of hit points to whatever they recover. For our level 13 damage report, things have again changed for us quite a bit. First off, 
thanks to how multiclassing works, we currently have a seventh level spell slot, meaning that we could upcast our animate objects to have 14 tiny little coins flying around and cutting into our enemies. We're also having our familiar concentrate on the slow spell, thanks to Arcane Abeyance, lowering enemies' armor class and dexterity saves by two, among the other fantastic debuffs that it brings, and now casting Disintegrate with our action instead of Scorching Ray. And yes, I'm going to go ahead and assume that we're using either Silvery Barbs or Chronal Shift to force an enemy to reroll their save if they succeed initially, greatly increasing the likelihood of success there. And thus, against an enemy with a 10 armor class and a plus zero to their dexterity save, we would on average during our Nova round here do 169 damage. And against an enemy with a 17 and a plus 7, it would be 149 damage. And that's awesome. Another huge bump since last check. And this puts us comfortably now in like the top half of tier 2 compared to other burst damage builds at this level. I really love the way that we're climbing the ladder here while simultaneously improving our support and utility capabilities as we go. It's fantastic. At level 14, we would be a bard 3, and that means second level bard spells. The main one I'd be sure to grab here is Lesser Restoration, which will let us cure diseases, the blinded, deafened, poisoned, or even paralyzed conditions as well. Really nice spell to have when you need it, and our support capabilities just keep getting better. We also, at this level, get expertise, and who doesn't love expertise? I love expertise. I bet you love expertise. That guy doesn't love expertise because he's a jerk. With expertise, you choose two skills you're proficient in and double your proficiency bonus for them. Awesome. Pick your favorites. You might want like perception and maybe acrobatics if you've got proficiency there. Those would probably be the things that would help us most in combat anyway to avoid grapples among other things. But I mean, I wouldn't be mad if you took arcana in religion. You do you. We also, though, get our Bard subclass, our Bard College, and we are gonna go with the College of Lore. Because, yes, we are intent on gathering all the lore we possibly can about this Time Master of old. Now, keep in mind that not all bards have to be musicians, right? And while you certainly could be, I definitely imagine this character to be one who is more of a storyteller than your run-of-the-mill dandelion Yaskir bard, personally. They might not even like performing all that much, perhaps saving their storytelling exclusively for their close friends and family alone. But as a lore bard, we get first up bonus proficiencies. You just straight up get to gain three skill proficiencies of your choice. And that's really pretty dang nice for utility. You could grab, if you didn't have them before, acrobatics and stealth here and use your expertise on those if you really want it. Regardless, you are truly becoming a very fine jack of all trades indeed. We also, as a lore bard, get cutting words, which is a lot of fun. Cutting words lets us use our reaction and one of our bardic inspiration dies when an enemy succeeds on an attack roll, ability check, or damage roll. Really wish they would have included the saving throw there, but oh well. Anyway, when an enemy succeeds on one of those things, we use our reaction, roll our bardic inspiration die, and we get to lower that enemy roll by a d6, our current bardic inspiration die, and we even get to wait until after that enemy roll to decide if we want to use it. Between this, silvery barbs, and chronal shift, we've got lots of uses of our reaction if we need it to really make sure that either an enemy fails when we really, really need them to fail, or sometimes an ally succeeds when we really, really need them to succeed. There's definitely a similar flavor here to this character as to the, um, the ultimate re-roller that I did a while ago. It feels very like warping the reality of time-ish, right? And I really love it. At level 15, we would be a bard 4, and that means we get another ability score increase or feat. We probably better take resilient constitution here, and let's be honest, with as dependent as we are on our concentration for damage, we should have taken this feat a long time ago if we didn't start with like a level 1 artificer dip, right? As is, if you haven't taken it by now, I definitely do so, to give us proficiency in our constitution saving throws and thus concentration checks. If you are going to do this, of course, consider starting your constitution score out as an odd number so that you can enjoy a nice little bump to your modifier now. At level 16, we would be a bard 5, and that means first up our bardic inspiration die jumps up to a d8. 
letting us be just a little more helpful to our allies when we inspire them, or a little more detrimental to our enemies when we cutting words them. We also get font of inspiration better yet, which means that uses of our bardic inspiration reset on a short rest now instead of a long, which is super nice for those of us with only a 14 charisma score especially. Kinda makes me wish we would have bumped our charisma last level instead. Stupid defense. And then, yes, we get third level bard spells. The one that I think I'd be sure to grab here is motivational speech. Unless your party already has a solid and reliable way to get temporary hit points, as motivational speech lets us, with a one minute speech, give up to five party members temporary hit points, and then so long as they have the temporary hit points, they will also have advantage on wisdom saving throws and they will get advantage on their next attack after they're hit by an attack. It can be upcast for more temporary hit points too, which is nice since the five temporary HP that it grants at this level isn't going to last very long against monsters that we're fighting at level 16. But still, every little bit helps, and there might be times when an enemy is going to start out combat with a spell that requires a wisdom saving throw or something, right? Or a dragon fear. And having advantage on that save will be great. But finally for us, at level 17, we would be a bard 6. Well, first up we get counter charm, and this not so great ability tells us that as an action, we can start a performance lasting until our next turn that gives us and our allies advantage on saving throws against being charmed or frightened. Again, like I've said before, if you could use this as a reaction, it would be a lot better. Oftentimes, fear and charm effects don't allow for a save once we're under their influence, and regardless, having to use up an entire action makes it a pretty subpar ability. But you know what? You might have a really great story about a time when you or someone at your table used counter charm to really great effect. And if so, I really want to hear about it in the comments. So please share. Convince me and maybe the rest of us that it's not as terrible an ability as we think. <laughs> but then the main reason that I wanted Bard and Lore Bard in the first place was for the lovely and amazing additional magical secrets that Lore Bards get at level 6. This lets us learn two spells from any class's spell list just like regular magical secrets that all bards get at level 10, so long as here at this level for us they are third level spells or lower. And you know what I want? What I really really want? Don't do it. I'm not gonna do it. If you said Crusader's Mantle, you win. It's true. For over a year now, I've had the following written on my to-do list for future character builds. Crusader's Mantle plus Animate Objects. A two-character build, or is there a way to get them on the same character? Chronergist? Question mark? And yeah, I think the only way we could get there before level 17 is by either going Lore Bard or War Domain Cleric, since Crusader's Mantle is only typically available to Paladins and War Domain Clerics. And yeah, honestly, I considered going War Domain with this build instead of Lore Bard. Among other things, it would be nice in that it would give us heavy armor and shield proficiency. That would have done great things for our survivability. But... I don't know. Everything else about War Cleric seems to be better suited for a great weapon user, and I plan on doing a War Cleric great weapon user sometime in the future, and I preferred the additional utility and support functionality from Lorebard personally. I wouldn't fault you for going War Cleric instead if you really, really wanted. Anyway, yeah, getting to this point was kind of the inspiration for this entire build, and even though we didn't get here until level 17, I'm super thrilled to be getting here. So, okay. Crusader's Mantle, it's not the greatest spell ever. It requires concentration and then gives all allies within 30 feet an extra d4 of radiant damage to their weapon attacks. You and your allies truly might still be better off with your familiar concentrating on slow, right? But man, when you're upcasting animate objects to a ninth level spell like we can now, that means 18 animated objects, and with Crusader's Mantle, that means 18d4 more damage. Made with advantage during our Nova round, but still 18d4 more damage on subsequent rounds, just not with advantage. So yeah, this does amazing things for both our Nova and our sustained DPR. 18d4 is kind of a lot. What's more, our other allies would benefit from the spell too. And yeah, again, not only during our Nova round, but for as long as our familiar 
can hold on to their concentration, so P.S. If you haven't been doing so, tuck your familiar into your backpack after they cast the spell. There's nothing that says they have to maintain line of sight after casting either Slow or Crusader's Mantle, so that might help them stay a little bit more safe anyway. But alright, for our final damage report here at level 17, like I said, we're now potentially casting animate objects at a ninth level spell to have 18 little coins or daggers flying around. We've added another d4 to each of their attacks, meaning that our animated objects alone will be doing potentially 36 d4 plus 72 damage. And that's a little loco. If we used our eighth level spell slot for disintegrate, Again, not suggesting you do either of these things, just exploring the possible. Disintegrate would do 16d6 plus 40 damage as well, and even though we're no longer slowing our enemies and so not getting a minus 2 to the enemy deck save, we do still have either Silvery Barbs or Chronal Shift to help ensure that they fail that very important deck save. And thus, against an enemy with a plus 10 to their AC and a plus 0 to their dexterity saving throw, on average, we would do 266 damage during our Nova round, and against an 18 AC and a plus 8 to save, it would be 208. And again, another massive gain compared to last check. This build scales better than almost anything that I've done to date, landing us kind of in the bottom of tier 1 compared to other burst damage builds at this level. And that just makes me so proud. <laughs> Look how far you've come, little time wizard. All right, let's wrap it up with some final thoughts. The tier score for this character, if you take the damage that they do at all of the armor classes and plus to saves that we calculate for at each of the four damage reports and just average them all into one big number, we end up with a 115. And that puts us right at the very bottom of tier two. So honestly, not a bad place to be, especially when you consider where we started. We just really weren't doing a ton for Nova damage in our early career in the attempt to get to level 10 Chronergy as soon as possible for that sweet, sweet arcane abeyance, right? So yeah, at the end of the day, this character is going to be a serious powerhouse. First and foremost, because they're mostly a wizard, so it just kind of comes with the territory. But I love how much burst damage we can potentially do, especially later, while at the same time doing some really nice things for the rest of our team. Whether that's severely hampering our enemies via the slow spell, or giving most of our team a nice damage bump via Crusader's Mantle, when you combine it with all the control, utility, and even support that the Time Wizard brings to the table especially, they might be my favorite wizard of all time? <laughs> Uh, next to the Blade Singer, of course. Don't worry, Singy. You'll always be my number one. But that is the build for the week, so I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. I had a blast. More than that, I hope you know how much I love you, because I truly do. You're amazing. Thank you so much for all that you do for me, for the channel. I hope that you'll check out the other content in the channel if you're not currently in the habit of doing so. But more than that, I hope that you stay safe, and that you be kind and good and happy and that I see you again very, very soon. But until then, take care. Bye-bye. Oh, I'm already recording. <laughs> I remember that time you told me love is touching souls. Well, surely you've touched mine Cause part of you pours out in me In these lines from time to time Whoa, you're in my blood like holy wine You taste so bitter and so sweet I could drink a case of you, darling and I would still be on my feet I would still be on my feet Joni Mitchell, one of the greatest of all time I have a really hard time with her voice It just is a little bit like fingernails on a chalkboard for me don't know why, but if you're looking for an amazing cover of that particular Joni Mitchell gem, A Case of You, 
Look Up. It was a song done a few years ago on The Voice, the show The Voice, and the girl's name who sang it, it was Maddie something. Maddie, The Voice, A Case of You. Google that, and you can thank me later, because it is gorgeous. Mike Creep. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> Stop it. Well, I already said that, so don't say that. Don't say that. Or, well, yeah, just say that. Do say that. <laughs> but they're definitely worth, well, just say that. Wow, that's twice now. Do say that. I have to redo. Ugh. Um, crap. <sighs> I need to redo some math. I hate having to redo some math in the middle of recording the episode. <laughs> okay, do this whole thing over. Okay. Let's do this.